Wednesday, August 28th here on the Just Baseball Show. You got Arm Layton and I am Peter Apple, and we are going to look at five players each. I got five hitters in the American League. Arm's got five hitters in the National League, and we also grabbed a pitcher. And what we're doing today is looking at guys that had rough first halves. You might have forgotten about them, but have been lighting the world on fire in the second half. We're also going to touch on Jeff Passan's new report about Juan Soto, the Soto sweepstakes when it comes to his free agency decision after the year. And we're going to end it with Arm's famous prospect report. And as always, we are brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sports books. Remember, folks, use code just baseball when downloading BetMGM whether that be on iOS or Android, and you get a first bet offer up to $1,500 back in bonus bets. And remember, download BetMGM, use promo code JUSTBASEBALL, and once you place that wager, if it loses, you'll get that amount back that you put on it, up to $1,500 back in bonus bets, or if you win, congratulations, you won a bet. We're also on the heels of winning the biggest bet of my entire life, the Marlins win total under. I'm very happy about it, but of course... We got on late the uh, Marlins fan. How are you feeling about that? Uh, great. Uh, Cause you know, I, I felt like I at least, you know, helped push you across that finish line. I would have felt yes, pretty guilty did. if, if it, if it lost. So I feel good. I'll be honest. Cause if they, you know, if it didn't hit, they're still not making the playoffs. So like, I would have just felt horrible. Uh, Cause you know, as you always do, like I think the, the people don't fully realize, or maybe they do how much like research you, you put into your own picks, but then also you're going to always consult people that are closer to the team or follow it a little bit more closely just to make sure that your thoughts are are sound. And like, you know, we, we talked plenty about it. I'm like, dude, let it rip. And I think that might have made you flip more. I, I don't want to speak for you, but that might have made you push all the chips forward. I don't know. But uh, all I know is I would have felt really guilty regardless um, because, you know, you felt really good about it. Uh, and when you said biggest bet of your life, I was like, oh, gosh, I wish I just said nothing. Um, so I'm glad you hit it and very comfortably as well, yeah. like very comfortably. Yeah hitting it under five weeks into the season. And I'm going to make a video later, which everybody will see probably on social media, post this, enjoying a steak, talking about winning the biggest bet of my life. And the yeah. reason I don't feel guilty, because taking it under when we cover baseball, like say whatever you want, we're not wishing the downfall on any organization at any single point. This was a business decision. And the reason yeah. I don't feel bad and I've been chirping Marlins fans. The reason I don't feel bad is this is good. You wanted a reset year. You almost I think they look so much better now. A year from hell. The GM fires half of the front office. The GM sells most of the players on the current team. It was a bad year from an injury standpoint. It was a tough year altogether. But now they at least have a path. Would you rather be dealing in mediocrity right now, get the 14th pick next year in the draft, probably blow that pick and just continue the cycle or do you want a plan do you want a future and that's what i think the marlins have now so i don't feel bad Clearly. because i think this will end up being good for them I, I agree and and that's why we talked about it i was like dude it, it, i think it's very clearly going to be okay last season was a fluke so we need to look at our situation okay well our farm system is one of the worst in baseball uh we still have positions that we are very very thin at from top to bottom in the organization but why wouldn't you sell and and i i didn't know if it was going to go that well in terms of being able to acquire the talent that they did but clearly you know peter bennett did a good job on that front so i do feel really good about you know what's what's going to happen moving forward but the other reason why i'm thrilled about you know, the, the marlins having the year that they had is that you know i get to to see my buddy you know make his, his big league debut i don't know if that happens you know if the year went more positively so that part was really cool and not lost in the uh, the the whole conversation here is that he's going to get his first start against Cal Quantrill uh, to, later today as we're recording this, which is hilarious. Um, and I think it's going to be the first time that in one at bat, you're not going to root for Cal, I'd imagine. This might be not the first time that you're not diehard Cal just for the four at bats or three, however many he gets against Cal. Um, that it, It's nice. It's nice that, that, you know, my friend can have that effect on you that it, it can even make you not be a Cal fan for maybe two, three at bats. I think that's, that's pretty powerful. It's the power of our friendship, I think. Aaron Judge is my favorite player. Cal Quantrill is my second favorite player. But unfortunately, 
for those two. Griff is in another tier. Yeah. Griff is your close personal friend. I've met him a bunch of times. Nicest guy in the world, just a savant when it comes to hitting. Like, I am totally rooting for his success beyond just favorite players, in quote, for all those watching on YouTube. And probably right after Cal Quantrill, in terms mm -hmm. of my favorite players, is Juan Soto. And Juan Soto, we heard from Jeff Passan, a new report. Um, and this is, again, according to Jeff Passan, ownership level and high-ranking front office sources think Juan Soto's free agency will be a battle between the Yankees and the Mets. We kind of already knew that, but I thought it was interesting that he also put in a couple of teams and the other teams that he put in that can afford him but are long shots to make the real push are the Red Sox, the Chicago Cubs, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Are they spending even more money? And of course, our favorite, the Los Angeles Angels. Huh. Now, Juan Soto, we already knew that this that this free agent offer was going to be one of the highest in sports history. This man is 25 years old, going to enter the market at a perfect time, and it couldn't be more perfect for the type of season that he's had so far this year. Slashing 296, 427, 600 for a 1027 OPS, set his career high in home runs already. We're in August at 37. He's got a 187 WRC plus, and he's third in F4 at 7.7. I posted on Twitter and I didn't get a lot of engagement because I think people think I was joking. <laughs> I said 15 years, $600 million to the Yankees. And you hear that contract and you think, Peter, what? 600 million over 15 years? That's never been done before. Yeah, 700 wasn't done either to show him yeah. Tony. Yeah. This guy's 25. He's one of the best hitters I've ever seen. His control of the batter's box is second to none, and that includes Aaron Judge. World Series champion already, has already performed in the spotlight, and I think that contract is only going to go a little bit higher if he goes crazy this postseason. But think about it, Arm. Is 15 years, $600 million going too high? Or does that feel right? That's $40 I mean million a year for 15 years. No, nothing feels right. So like that, that's the thing, right? So like it, you just have to almost look at it from the lens of, well, is it realistic be, based on what we've seen prior? And I think it absolutely is. Um, none of these numbers feel right. And I'm not saying that I'm against it. I'm get, get the players, all the money they, they deserve. I doesn't, doesn't matter to me, uh, but anytime those numbers are thrown out, it just, it just, it's just so bizarre and crazy. But I mean, how, how, if he turned down 400 and he's only been better and better and better with less control now an open market free agent, I mean, it, it's got to start north of five. And that's where I could see that Yankees Mets bidding war uh, really driving this thing up. And that's got to be a dream for Scott Boris, right? Because of course the Yankees, they don't want to lose him uh, for very obvious reasons in the optics of losing him to the quote unquote little brother uh, and, and just losing him to the crosstown rival. Uh, would be really, really tough. Um, and I don't think it's anything that would crush the Yankees, but it would it would be a tough one to to, to fully come back from. And you're just not going to be able to replace that production. It's not going to be possible. You can still field a good team, but you, you ain't replacing that production. And I mean, the, the whole story with the Yankees this year is how they've been really a two-headed monster predominantly. How do you answer that next year? What if Judge doesn't quite match what he did? Then you really feel it. Uh, how does it affect Judge when Soto's not there? Clearly, Judge is getting pitched to more. That has helped him. Like, it's a non-negotiable, I think, for the Yankees to retain this guy the same way it was a non-negotiable for them to retain Aaron Judge. But the other side of it, though, is, you know, Soto's just proved that he can not only perform, and, and, and we've seen that already, but him doing it in a big market, right? Like that could have been maybe one thing. Like how does he handle the big market, whatever it is. Like San Diego is a bigger market than Washington, D.C., but it still is not, not you know, a huge, huge shift. And he didn't perform quite as well there. He goes to New York and he's, he's put up video game numbers and he's looked as comfortable as can be. And he's clearly just built for it. So I, I, I think it's going to be Steve Cohen just trying to push and push and make this difficult for the Yankees. And that's the only scary part is, you know, he's, he's kind of playing with, with a different level of, of, of financial ability. But at the end of the day, the Yankees should be able to match anything, right? Like they're, they're the New York Yankees. And if they backload it, Stanton is, you can now see the light at the end of the tunnel with the Stanton contract. It's not like Garrett Cole is under contract for 15 more years. 
Uh, DJ LeMay, he was going to be coming off the books. Like they could probably find a way to backload that and, and just it be, make it kind of similar to the Otani thing where it's a big deferrals, but push it up over 600. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested to see how they approach it. It's going to have to be a creative contract. I'd imagine. I love that you made the points about the protection for Aaron judge. Um, because I think it's so big. It's not like uh, Juan Soto is hitting behind Aaron judge, but even hitting in front of him and then it's providing huge. some protection with Austin Wells too. That is another reason why Aaron judge has been so unbelievably prolific. It's not the only reason, but it certainly helps. And to just further your other point, you can't be like Billy Bean in Moneyball and say, and snap at Jonah Hill and say, can we recreate him in the aggregate? You can't recreate <laughs> you can't. 600 slugging percentages and 430 OBPs, the ability to hit 300 while also playing good defense in the outfield, which is an area of concern in the past for Juan Soto, where a lot of us thought, well, this is just the bat. He was playing terrible, terrible defense. That has ticked up. You can see he's locked in. And a locked in Juan Soto is as good as any player in Major League Baseball. And the fact that he's 25. So I have another question for you. Unless you want to build on that point. I just wanted to say one thing about the, the the protection. When you're getting on base 43% at the time, like you're not going to now walk judge to have two guys on and, and you know, risk that. You're putting someone in scoring position now and two on. And it's not like the, you know, Austin Wells, he's been huge too. So that's been helpful. But regardless, like the statistical probability of a run scoring when you have a runner on second base and no outs or just two aboard makes a huge difference. One swing blows the game open. So that protection in front is is absolutely huge, um, and I think that's we've seen the results of with with Judge seeing more pitches in the zone. But sorry, what what was the, what was the question? My last question is more curiosity, and I don't think you have an answer to this. I don't think anybody has an answer to this yet. But I just want to do a thought exercise. Do you think Soto would be privy to an eight year four hundred million dollar contract taken from his age twenty five season? to likely his age 32, 33 season, and then try and hit the open market again, because we know that these contracts just get bigger and bigger every single year. Imagine what they're going to be in eight years when that contract is over. And if Soto believes that he is going to be a prolific bat for the next 15 years anyway, you could re-enter the market at 33 years old and potentially make another 300 million instead of going, we want all 600 million now. And maybe I'm saying 300 million to a 33 year old. Maybe it's more like, we don't know what the landscape will look like from a monetary value. Like we don't know. We're just guessing. It's, it's a great question because like, it, it, and of course it all depends on how they want to approach it. But if you were thinking about maximizing career earnings, um, this is similar to the Harper situation where you could actually go, shorter term or now you know harper was kind of in between they went a little too long and now that's why they're trying to get the extension but how often do you have a player that's going to hit free agency be only 26 years old but will still have almost a thousand games under his belt proven being one of the best hitters in major league baseball so you have this track record that is like foolproof that you're going to be willing to shell out a, a ton of money but also he's super young it's this unique spot where you could go short term massive contract and then at 30 31 when most players are, are hitting the open market he could sign another mega deal so in terms of maximizing potential earnings I, definitely possible i just wonder if it gets to a point where it's like who cares yeah. um and, like, and just, just lock in the 600 yeah, but it, the it might also give them the freedom to not be tied to to one team especially if they don't want to give them the opt-outs or anything like that but i'd imagine he's going to get whatever he wants but it is a great question. And if they want to approach it that way, like this is a very unique scenario where you have a 26 year old who will have had almost a thousand games of 960 plus OPS, whatever, whatever he's going to settle in on after the end of the year. And, and still just, just being that young is, is pretty remarkable. I was also thinking uh, because the Dodgers got very, you know, creative with the way that they backloaded a contract for Shohei Otani. I'm almost thinking that some of these contracts now for the elite of the elite, and I'm not even just talking about Soto next year, what Otani already did, um, the guys that we haven't even seen yet. See, Jesus Mate with the Brewers. Let's say he becomes everything <laughs> you think he is going to be in more, right? And then maybe a kid who we haven't even seen yet that's currently 13 years old, whether he's maybe playing in the Little League World Series or he's playing in Latin America or wherever he's playing. I wonder if the contracts are going to get so big that they're going to start offering like 
five percent of Yankees merch sales or just like I mean, insane... that's that's what the Inter Miami did with with Messi. Obviously, that's a ridiculous example where you have the the best soccer player but at least i i think sorry don't i, I don't know if soccer fans will be like ah ronaldo i don't know enough about soccer i know I, from what no, i understand make, Messi... make a clear point right now let's do yeah, that yeah ronaldo a Messi hot debate. soccer take we'll follow it with lebron jordan and then we'll get into the players who've had better second halves and you know we'll have one of those episodes <laughs> that'd be a banger yeah. um but like he, he was getting a cut of jersey and apple tv sales and whatever like i know teams are going to fight tooth and nail to avoid that ever happening um, but you know, as these contracts get closer to, you know, numbers starting with a B y- you wonder, you know, who's going to be maybe that, that player that fully, fully breaks the system. And it might be, uh, the next Otani, if that ever happens, uh, you know, it might be something like that, who knows? Uh, but we're definitely seeing these free agencies, like just, just ch- like really shift to, to a degree that I don't think is, has really ever happened this, this I think starkly uh, and, and, and really ever. I think we're really seeing the change over the last 10 years as, as much as, as ever. I cannot wait to see what the contract looks like for Juan Soto because it's going to blow everybody's mind. Before we get into arms got five, I got five. We're going to look at some of the better second halves for guys who struggled in the first half. I'm asking all of those who are watching this currently on YouTube. We get a couple thousand people listening to each YouTube video. I ask if you guys could just like the video. Hit that subscribe button. It is the best way to support. It only takes a second to just pre- press the like video. If you have been enjoying videos coming to you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for the entire season in the off season, we try and give you guys as much content as possible. So if you have a second, if you can rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or if you're watching on YouTube, just hit the like button or hit the subscribe button or both. We really really appreciate it so thank you again to everybody who is listening we try and create these episodes that are going to be the most entertaining for you and we'll start with five and five so arm i have the american league you have the national league i'd Mm -hmm. like to go back and forth so i'll bring a hitter you bring a hitter and we'll just we'll ping pong you in for that yep i'm ready to go and this is fun this was i I love this idea from you because um you know it it's one of those things that it just seems to be that the all-star break just can be this reset for players. And mm. it, it's, it's crazy how like significant the shifts are for some of these guys. And most of my players are, are maybe not superstars, but they're all big, big names. And it maybe, maybe in one superstar or potential superstar. So it, it's all like talented players, but it, it's just amazing to see how, how they shift. I'll start with, with maybe a, a lesser of, of the, you know, big names, but it's just been, I think, as dramatic of a shift as, as anybody. It's, it's got to be Jake Berger of the yeah. Marlins, who in the first half was slashing 225, 265, 370. That's a 73 WRC+. plus. Since the All-Star break, I don't think there's been a hitter. You, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's been a hitter that's been better than Jake Berger in, in Major League Baseball, at least from a power perspective. Since the All-Star break, 35 games, he's Eric slashing – yeah, of course. Of course. That, that's a good point. That's yeah. a good point. That's a good point. That I like almost like forget. Like he's almost in his own like Barry Bonds category. But no, it's almost for- like Otani and Judge. They're just when we're saying he might be the most most prolific power hitter, just besides Judge and Otani. Like I came out. Remember when I gave the Bobby Witt Jr. might be the most talented player in Major League Baseball outside of Otani because he's yeah. really yeah. fast and he pitches and he hits. <laughs> besides those two. Besides the guy who the guy. hits a, a home run every single minute, here's the guy that hits a home run every like few minutes. Yes. And Jake Berger has 15 homers in his last 35 games, slashing 295, 382, 689. I mean, th- just this, the shift there, a 73 WRC plus to a 187 WRC plus. He's got the strikeout rate in check at 26%. Uh, he's just one of those guys that when he's hot, I mean, it, it's going to be one of those stretches that – is up there with just about anybody not named Otani and Judge and you know maybe one or two others. But when it comes to like players that probably won't make an all-star game or you know, maybe, maybe in in a really good year, we'll, we'll sneak into one or two. I don't know if there's a lot of players that heat up the way that Berger does. And we've seen this, you know, last year too. Uh, but this has been as ridiculous of a stretch as I've seen. I mean, 15 home runs in 35 games for a guy that's, you know, again, not not a perennial, you know, MVP candidate. Uh, it's been cool to see Berger, you know, really, really like settle in here because he's a great guy. Uh, and and you know, his story is you know, double Achilles tears as a uh, 
it's always someone I'm going to root for. And it's just cool to see, you know, after what was, he looked really bad in spring training. He looked, I saw him on the backfields getting, you know, to, diced up at points against minor leaguers. And now, I mean, he, nobody can get him out. Uh, he almost hit his 16th in, in his in, in 35 games yesterday at, at Coors Field, just missed it at the wall, but he, he's been a monster. And the reason I, I really wanted to do this exercise too, is because when you look at Jake's Ber Jake Berger's season numbers mm -hmm. you might not say oh wow what a hitter but what we can do is say well he had, he struggled in the first half but then look what he did in the second half and look how we can build on that to be more consistent in 2025 that's kind of the exercise here mm -hmm. you might have forgotten about these guys but they're still prolific baseball players and i was looking into jake Berger's contract tons of years of arbitration yep. I mean, you're four in 2028. This isn't a guy that the Marlins should consider extending, right, to potentially get through those years of arbitration. Doesn't have to be very expensive. I'm curious just because, you know, you're calling up a lot of young guys who can all play the infield. Is Jake yeah. Berger going to be that older veteran, even though he's not old at all, yeah. but just in relation to the Miami Marlins, they're – really young team right now. Do you think that Berger is more of a building block or do you see this as a second half where you're happy about it, but you don't know if it's really going to continue? That's a good question. Cause I think they're probably still asking the same thing, right? You're waiting on a Davis and Dola Santos. What, what does he look like at the big league level? You're waiting on Augustine Ramirez, who they acquired from the Yankees in the jazz trade. Is he sticking behind the dish or does he end up moving, you know, to first base? Like those are the things that, you know, if, if those guys are, performing at the big league level and you know you you feel good about them then you know burger becomes a little bit you know, less important or maybe a little bit more expendable uh but i i think the team feels like he's some of that continuity you know and and, and a little bit of at least relatively speaking a, a proven player and i know that they, you know they want to get back to being semi-competitive sooner sooner rather than later and you see a lot of the prospects they acquired or or like upper minors guys that could be up next year. So I think the goal is kind of to move Berger to first, have him play there more. And then if he gets, you know, unseated by Davis and De Los Santos, great. You know, then he could DH or one of them can DH or whatever it is. But I think for now they, they like that they have him for four more years after this one. And, you know, if, if they decide that, you know, he's, he's extra, well, they could still trade him in ARB two in 2026 with two and a half years of control. So I feel like they're, they're, they feel like they're playing with house money right now. And the fact that he's performing the way that he has, I think makes them feel pretty good that they can kind of pencil him into first base and then see what De Los Santos does. And, you know, I mean, this is a team that'll take all the bats they can get. So, um, you know, I think, I think it puts him in, in, a, in a, a nice spot that the fact that he's been able to turn his season around the way he has. My first player already signed a big time contract, five years, 90 million. And his second half is, I think, what the Boston Red Sox were hoping when they signed Masataka Yoshida. Mm -hmm. So, in the first half, pre All Star break, this guy was slashing 260, 325, 373 for a 698 OPS. If you're not playing defense, like Yoshida doesn't really, I mean, he tries to play left field, mm -hmm. he's just not a great defender. You bought him for 90 million because of his bat. And 698 OPS, what he did last year, it's just not good enough. Mm -mm. But post All Star break, holy shit. Slashing 339, 416, 534 for a 950 OPS. He's 14th in WRC plus post All Star break at 163. That's higher than Francisco Lindor and Jose Ramirez. He never really struck out at all, even in his worst times. But to see him cut the strikeout rate down from 15% in the first half to 10% in the second half. And we talk about Yoshida too. The ground ball rate is a little bit too high. Well, it's been cut mm -hmm. from 43 and a half to 37%. Hard hit rate increased by 6%. And it's not just, oh, well, now he's just pulling more fly balls in the air. No, he's just making harder contact to all fields. Now, Yoshida was a guy who you were really, really high on coming over from the MPB. And I remember kind of making fun of you just because I'm a Yankee <laughs> fan and he's a Red Sox big, like he sucks, he sucks, he sucks. Not really beating it, but just poking fun. But I think this is much closer to the bat that you were expecting when they signed him to this big deal. 
Well, it's funny too, because we saw it kind of flip-flopped last year, right? He was really solid in the first, not this good, but he was really solid in the first yeah, half. He's fine. And then fell off a cliff. Yeah. Like he was an above average. I think he was held around a 115, 120 WRC plus in the first half and then fell off a cliff. And then that kind of trickled into this, this season, slow out of the gate. And I think you hit the nail on the head when it comes to just lifting the ball more. I think that really has been a huge part of it because when you're, when you're driving it in the air the other way too, and he's a guy that can spray tall fields, it, you, you can just pepper that wall, but then also, you know, hitting it in the air anywhere is just going to translate more. He's always had the bat to ball, but now it's being hit at a trajectory where, you know, he, it's going to translate into more extra base hits. And, you know, I think that's something that has made a huge, huge difference for him. And I think it's made a huge difference for the Red Sox too. I still think that they've got this like surplus here and they're going to figure all that out. But now either they feel better about Yoshida moving forward or his contract just became a lot more movable if they want to go younger with their outfield and, and DH spots. So uh, I think this is regardless a, a great development for the Red Sox because it, it affords them maybe a little bit more of an option to to do other things. I think also the swing decisions are just really impressive. He doesn't chase, he doesn't really chase secondary stuff much at all either. Uh, I mean, walking as much as he's striking out since the all-star break, as you said, it's just really impressive. Yeah. The Red Sox themselves, they've been trickling down. They've had a couple of bad losses lately. A um, couple of bad series, which has really hurt their playoff chances. And, but it's not the offense. The offense is prolific. They have so many fantastic bats in that lineup. Like, Will you Abreu and Jaron Duran at the top, and then Yoshida stepping in. Koss is coming back. Devers is just a freak of nature, and there's mm -hmm. plenty of others that I haven't even named. But they're they've all just been so good this year. It's just the starting rotation has kind of fallen apart, and the bullpen is arguably baseball's worst since July first. They got an ERA almost at six, so it hasn't been the offense. And Yoshida is a guy who has been just fantastic in that Red Sox offense. So who's your next guy? Next guy is a, a player who, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, like just how they could get some more shine and it's just important to, to note some of these players. Also, these are players that could make a big difference down the stretch for mm -hmm. a postseason push. And this is exactly what I think Gavin Lux all of a sudden might be doing for the Dodgers. I mean, in the first half of the season, this guy was, was brutal. I, it was, it was tough to watch. I was starting to wonder if they should you know start to look at, at other options and, you know, their patience seems to have really, been rewarded here and and you know the Dodgers are a smart org right so they clearly felt like there were be better days ahead continuing to play him through 77 games despite slashing in the first half 213 267 295 the old 222 slash line 60 WRC plus three home runs and only 13 extra base hits since then in the second half 333 402 620 seven home runs so he's more than doubled the home run total in half the less than half the games 14 extra base hits a 182 wrc plus and he's accumulated a 1.7 f war in those 33 games that's crazy big thing for him is similar to what we're talking about with yoshida and i do think that there's been some you know positive batted ball luck here and you know i think there's some regression coming but okay cool regress he's still way better than he was in the first half and there's still some really exciting things here because this guy doesn't need to be 333 with a thousand OPS he just needs to be a solid hitter to complement the rest of the lineup he has been elevating a lot more and and you know he was putting the ball on the ground at a 54 percent clip in the first half he's cut that by nearly 10 percent in the second half I, I think you're just seeing him more comfortable elevating the ball to all fields he's driving it the other way but he's he's also getting into the pull side power a bit more because this is not a guy that's going to light it up from the exit velocity perspective usually right around average slightly above average in that department so the trajectory that you're hitting the ball at is, is going to be pretty important so seeing that shift from him has been huge if you look at his hard hit launch angle so averaging the launch angle of all of his balls that are 95 plus miles per hour off the bat went from six degrees to 13 so just doubling that up you know that's going to result in, uh, I think, a lot more slug, and we're seeing that. And he's also been defending a lot better as well. I think Lux finally is kind of settling into that complementary role. And again, even if he's a 110 WRC plus the rest of the way and through the playoffs, that's all the Dodgers need. They've they've got the guys at the top. They just needed to not be a gaping hole on the backside. And I always want to revert back to talking about a player's age because I always think it's important. And we also have to remember that Aaron Judge – 
in his rookie year when he hit 50 plus home runs was 25 years old. Gavin Lux is 26 years old. Sometimes it just takes these guys a little bit longer. And a guy again with Gavin Lux, tippity top prospect. I think at one time he was the number one prospect in baseball. Do you feel like he's kind of starting to settle into the player that he was projected to be? I so it's funny. I always felt like that the the issue with his projections was that it didn't they didn't account for the PCL enough then, I guess. I don't know what it was, but his power grades got just jacked up too much. But I do think if you adjust for what his raw power really is, which is you know average or slightly above. I think he's growing into that player potentially where it's, you know, well-rounded across the board. Of course, would love to have seen him be able to play more shortstop. Maybe that comes along later as he you know, figures things out from the, the throwing perspective, like whatever was one awry for him there. But I, I think this is maybe not quite what he, you know, what, what everybody wants in vision, but I think it's still a really solid outcome potentially here where you have an above average hitting second baseman who can play good defense and um, not potentially hit 20 to 25 home runs. And I mean, you take that any day of the week uh, on any team, but especially when you've got most of the the other positions well taken care of. So my next guy, you mentioned that Jake Berger might be the most prolific power hitter in baseball in the second half outside of Aaron Judge. Well, outside of Aaron Judge, the second best hitter in Major League Baseball in the second half is my arch nemesis. And I'm bringing him to the table. Vladimir Guerrero. <laughs> Junior, I need to give this man more flowers than anyone ever. This man in the second half is slashing 415. Yep. Let that settle in. 415, 500, <laughs> 846, where Judge is slugging around 876 for a 1346 OPS. He's got 13 home runs and 130 ABs. In the first half, 14 home runs and 374 ABs. And you're probably wondering, why are you bringing him to this exercise? He was fine in the first half. You're right. He was fine. Slash 289, 360, 457 for an 817 OPS. But a bad defender at first, putting up an 817 OPS, that's still not Vladdy. That still isn't this, this version is as good as any hitter in major league baseball. This so is the triple, cr- this is the triple crown threat. Vladdy. This is better. Yeah. I mean, this is unbelievable what he has been doing for the blue Jays who are low key red hot right now. Yeah, I know. They're right on. The, they're right with the rays. They're right there. They're heating up. And Vladdy has just been the cog in this engine strikeout rate. We're talking about, a guy who doesn't really strike out that much, Vladdy, 16%. It's not too bad in the first half. He's striking out 8% in the <laughs> second half. He's walking 13% and striking out 8 Juan Soto can't even do that. His ground ball rate, we talk about it all the time. What does Vladdy need to do with how hard he hits the ball? Elevate the baseball, and that's what he's done. Ground ball rate down 9%, hard hit rate up 7%. He has a 266 WRC plus in the second half. Only trailing Aaron Judge. Why did I hate Vladdy? Well, it cost me nine thousand dollars. That's <laughs> one. But number two, it frustrated the hell out of me because I watched a young guy come up and nearly win the triple crown. He was one of my favorite guys to watch hit. Just clockwork at such a young age pillaging baseballs i was surprised that a baseball would make it through the game after he would hit it even on the ground because of how hard he was putting the bat on the baseball and then last year so many balls on the ground bad a b swinging early at bad pitches and i'm thinking to myself what happened where'd you go first half i was a little bit intrigued he was better but still i was disappointed second half dear god he is, to call him a human being is disrespectful. He's 25, by the way, too, and, like, doesn't turn 26 until March. And the he's crazy phenomenal. part is, yeah, he's the he's been better than Berger, obviously, from um, in the second half. Slightly less home runs, though. That's, that's the only thing. You, you said yeah. power. You said power, <laughs> to be fair. Uh, here's the craziest thing. He's been the most 
one of the most complete hitters I, I can remember over a stretch in a while where so the last in the second half against non fastballs he's hitting 471 that's ridiculous with 11 home runs I, 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 just, I don't even know I what to add to under, that. I don't understand how that's <laughs> how that's possible you know so like, that's really good hold on when you and I were just like uh we're like talking over each other because we don't know how to break that down because it's just so otherworldly we've never seen it we're just uh, 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 uh. he's 471 in 75 plate appearances against secondary stuff like that's just it, that i've never really seen that it's a small <laughs> yeah, sample but it's it's not it's not nominal um it's just been so much fun to watch this guy hit and you talk about the bat speed it's 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 just about unmatched He's ridiculous. He's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. And hey, remember when I said 0.2% for the Blue Jays? It's up. We're looking at 0.4. Just Ooh, saying. that's double. They're climbing. They're climbing. They're climbing. <laughs> so who's your next guy? A guy that's kind of helped his team hang around in, in the playoff hunt as well with his second half is Jeff McNeil. And mm-hmm. Jeff McNeil, I mean, look at what he did in the first half. 216, 276, 314. And you, know, you, you got that extension. You know, it's been a little bit up and down for him. So I was curious to see, like, maybe this is the new norm for a 32-year-old Jeff McNeil. Nope, never mind. Uh, let's 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 adjust and let's give the man a little bit more time here. And, and we're seeing that very clearly. He's flashing 298, 364, 596 in the second half. Seven home runs. 17 extra base hits and a 166 WRC plus just to put that in perspective he had 19 extra base hits in 85 games in the first half he has 17 extra base hits in 31 games in the second half so you know McNeil has always been a guy that's going to put bat on ball right and spray it all over the yard and it's going to be tough to strike out but he's also you know in the first half I think was trying to be this full-fledged I'm just going to put the bat on the ball and and flare it wherever it's pitched and I think it got to the point where it was really compromising quality of contact. So now, you know, of course, he still has the ability to shoot it the other way and and, and to do those things and to get to pitches in r- ridiculously tough spots. But he's leaning into the pull side a little bit more, especially when he's in adva- advantage counts. Like, hey, I've got enough power to pull balls out, you know, and, and, and do some damage. So instead of just like automatically early in counts, giving out his B swing and, and, you know, maybe putting the ball in play, you know, not as hard as, as he could, you know, he's, he's trying to let it eat earlier in counts and then he'll go into defense mode, choke up more with, with two strikes. And, you know, I think we're seeing him pull the ball more with success, hit the ball harder in general, and then still fend off those strikeouts. Still only striking out 17% of the time. Yeah. That's more than 12% in the first half, but who cares when you're slugging and you're hitting the ball better overall. So I think he kind of got a little bit further away from this, the, I got to put bat on ball and a little bit more well-rounded of a hitter. That's going to do some damage and then still be that bat to ball guy that can fend off strikeouts. He shows how talented he is as a hitter, right? We talk about who are the best bat to ball guys in baseball. Two names rise to the top. Luis rise of the San Diego Padres and Stephen Kwan of the Cleveland guardians. But Jeff McNeil has been in these conversations for a while, but it's kind of slowed, maybe due to age, maybe also due to a little bit of production. But you see what can happen with a guy this talented when he makes a simple adjustment. The fact that he's even able, like one thing to do it, one thing is to be able to do, to be able to slug 596. It's incredible from Jeff McNeil, and it just points to his talent as a hitter. Like, hey, you don't have to make contact with everything and just, Hope it lands in the outfield. Get your pitch. Choke mm-hmm. up with two strikes. We know you're not going to strike out anyway. And if you do strike out a little bit more, it's okay because you can tap into that pull side power, and which has been huge for the Mets who are still fighting to make the playoffs. So move into my third guy. Um, this is a player who I just love and I think is one of the premier young catchers in Major League Baseball. But he was really disappointing in the first half. That's Yiner Diaz of the Houston Astros. Now, Yiner Diaz wasn't bad because he's always going to hit. But 284, 308, 409 slash line for a guy of his pedigree for a 717 OPS, it's not going to cut it because the defense is not elite by any stretch. So for Yiner Diaz to be very valuable and to be considered one of the best catchers in baseball, he has to hit. And what has he done in the second half? Hit. And hit with authority, hit. slashing 338, 364, 577 for a 941 OPS. So his 
OPS went up 250 points nearly. In the second half, remember when I said Yoshida is higher than guys like Lindor and Jose Ramirez? Yander Diaz is tied with Yoshida. 14th best WRC plus in the second half at 163. Hard hit rate through the roof. It's up 10%. The ground ball rate down 5%. I would say, oh, he made these specific adjustments and maybe he made small ones, but I think this is just who he is. He's a catcher who can have a 900 OPS in Major League Baseball. That's Mm -hmm. why he's so prolific. And that's why moving forward, I'm putting him real high on my catcher rankings because even if he plays average defense, the bat is just going to come to play. I mean, this guy can mash with the best of them. I think he's just a streaky hitter because, you know, he's going to be a guy that just he chases a lot, right? He's not going to walk. He's going to he's going to swing a lot. He's going to get to a lot of pitches. And, you know, there's going to be stretches where he's getting himself out and there's going to be stretches where he's just crushing everything. And I'm with you, though. I think he's as talented as they come um, behind the dish offensively outside of the obvious. And um, another guy that isn't even 26 yet. (laughs) He hits the ball so hard and and so consistently. When you blend the the contact rates and the exit velocities, I mean, he's going to be too too productive, or he's going to hit the ball too hard, too consistently to not be able to to put together good stretches. I just think there's going to be those cold stretches here and there. But I I think ultimately, as he cuts down, hopefully on the chase, that'll be like the big separator. Um, and even just cutting down on it a couple ticks, I think has has helped in the second half. But it really just seems like he's going to be one of those guys that's a free swinger. And when he's hot, he's hot. Look out. And when he's not, you know, you got to weather the storm a little bit. But you always know that guys like that are going to, like, come out the other side. 100%. I got nothing more to add. You want to move on to your next? Let's do it. We got Eugenio Suarez, who, I mean, I think this has been a very clear shift. As, and another team that, like, of course, I got two D-backs that we're going to talk about back to back here. I think you can you can you know guess who who the next one is. Honestly, the honorable mention is a third D-back. So it's not a surprise why the D-backs have been playing much better ball. But you know, they went out and got Gino Suarez for a reason. I mean, they, they wanted him to, to be the slugger at third base and be a guy for them. And there was a point in time this year where you know there were reports that hey, like they, they're willing to move off of him, but you know, I don't know if anybody really wanted him. I I, I mean, why would you want him through that first half where he was slashing 216, 302, 366? with an 87 WRC plus since then 301 333 609 slash line 10 home runs a 154 WRC plus I I wish I could just pinpoint one specific thing but it just seems like he's just settled in like he's just making a little bit more contact he's driving the ball in the air a little bit more Uh, he just seems to be controlling his at bats a little bit more um I think there was a point in time where he was almost too passive at, at times and just, you know, taking pitches that he should hit and then expanding on pitches that he shouldn't swing at where now I think he just seems more settled into his approach. And I mean, this is a dude that will do damage and 10 home runs in 34 games is like, a, we've seen him have those stretches. What was shocking was seeing 10 home runs in 93 games and not really doing much else otherwise either. So it's been fun to see him really settle in here and and be the guy that we've been kind of used to seeing, you know, over the last few years. Again, streaky for sure, uh, pretty aggressive hitter, but you always like, were waiting on those upswings. And I think this was just one of the longer downswings that we'd seen from him where at 33, it became, again, in that question of, is this a downswing or is this like a just kind of a decline? And it seems like it was just a downswing, which is great news for the D-backs and, of course, Suarez. And, you know, I'm excited to see how he keeps this thing rolling. And August could have been a really tough month for the Diamondbacks. The rotation has been a little bit inconsistent. You don't know truly who you can rely on. Like, Gallon is coming off a good start, but it was a lot of bad starts. Kelly's been on the shelf. He's still working his way back. Brandon Fott's been good, not great. You have Jay Mott moving back to the bullpen. Ryan Nelson has stepped up, but... And Eduardo Rodriguez, of course. But you just have a lot of inconsistency. Then Cattell Marte goes down. Christian Walker hasn't played the entire month. And Gabby Moreno has only played five games. And they have the number one offense in baseball in August. Why? Because of guys like Chino Suarez. So before we get to, I have two more hitters. I think Arm has one more. One more. And we both have a pitcher. And then we're going to end with the prospect report. But before that, a quick break. All right, let me get into my fourth hitter on the list. And this is a guy who I can't believe made the list, but I've been watching some Mariners baseball, and hey, got to give him his flowers. Jorge Polanco of the Seattle Mariners. So he has a 151 WRC plus in the second half. 
That is 26th in the league. That's higher than guys like Corey Seager, Manny Machado, Pete Alonso, and William Contreras. His strikeout rate is down 5%. Walk rate is up 3%. And that's just strikeouts and walks. But this guy is finally just hitting the ball into the air and hitting it with far more authority. His fly ball rate, obviously his ground ball rate is much better. Fly ball rate up 14%. Hard hit rate up 17%. The Mariners didn't just make a mistake by bringing in Jorge Polanco. This was a guy with a lot of power in Minnesota who they were hoping would add a little bit of thump to their lineup. And he didn't. In the first half specifically for this team, he slashed 197, 285, 282, zero thump for a 567 OPS. I was even on this show saying, I mean, DFA him, give up. I mean, what is this? This has been horrible. Thank God they didn't listen to me. 261, 352, 532 for an 884 OPS in the second half. He's almost doubled the amount of home runs, five in the first half in 213 ABs, eight in the second half in only 111, about half the ABs. He's got more RBIs. He's even got two steals to only one steal in the first <laughs> half, but I'm just going through all the numbers. But Jorge Polanco is a guy who I think myself, talking to the Marine Layer pod guys about it, Mariners fans completely gave up on him. I mean, but don't, don't, do so, don't do it so soon. This guy's been great in the second half. Fastballs, just mashing fastballs, right? Like he's still going to struggle with secondary stuff. It's kind of been a theme there, but if you mash fastballs, it, you could still get yours. And and I think that's really been the shift here where in, in the first half, he hit 220 with a 661 OPS against fastballs. And in the second half, he's hitting 413 uh, with a 1400 OPS against fastballs. Again, a very small sample. It's about 50 five plate appearances, but it, it does make a huge difference when you're hitting, you know, the more hittable pitches that you're going to see, because, you know, most guys are going to struggle with secondaries and he struggles even more. So puts even more pressure to produce on those heaters. So I, I'm glad to see him hitting because, you know, when, when he's healthy and, and when he's, you know, clicking, you know, he's really fun to watch. And, and and we've seen him have some really, really fun stretches, but I, I just feel like the injuries have really slowed him down over the last couple of years. And, maybe it's been just residual effects here. So I'm hoping that this means, you know, he's just gotten healthier and he's feeling a little bit more like himself again. Uh, and, and he could keep this thing rolling, but regardless, it's just been nice to see him, you know, cut down on, on the weak contact and, and just start to lean into that power that has made him a, a successful big leaguer for some time. And one last point before we get to your fifth and final hitter, I do feel there is an element of going to Seattle playing in that ballpark where Teoscar Hernandez himself said it's much harder to hit there. You look at pitcher splits. They're so much better at T-Mobile. Not only are the fences really far, but there must be something in the batter's eye that makes it difficult to read. So if you're a guy like Jorge Polanco, who's already pressing because he really needs to impress some people to continue to get a job, struggles in a park like that, brings that on the road with him, doesn't feel like himself, sits down during the all-star break, remembers who he is as a hitter, probably gets a little bit more healthy, figures it out, and then puts up numbers like he did with the Twins at his peak. I think it could have just been a little bit of development. You're moving to a new place, you're pressing early, and then you're able to kind of alleviate some of that and just go balls to the wall and look at what he's doing right now. So feel free to get to your fifth and final. Yeah. Mariners needed that bad and they still Badly. do and they need all the help they can get. Um, so hopefully, you know, they're still three and a half keep... back. It ain't over yeah, yet. Not at all. And, and you know, that, that they legitimately would be in even more trouble if it weren't for, for his resurgence. So you know, hopefully, you know, J rod and a few other guys can, can kind of get heating up too. But um, talking about resurgence and, you know, continuing on the diamondbacks trend, I could have mentioned Josh bell here, but I just think the magnitude of Corbin Carroll is, is where he gets the edge. But just by the way, in passing Josh bell, second half, nine home runs, one fifty seven WRC plus, which is absurd. And that did start with the Marlins and then like trickled in to the D back. So he, it's something clicked there. And then of course going out in Arizona is going to help, but Corbin Carroll, man, like we've talked about him so much on the show. I'd be remiss to not have him included here as one of the guys that has been one of the most impressive it just transitions into the second half and, and just really turning the page. And, and what I love about it is we've talked about the swing 
and, and the overstriding and, and some of the mechanical things. If you look at it now, and I we talked about it, you know, a couple of weeks ago or maybe a week ago, where he, the, the the bat position when he gets to his slot is 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 back to where it was before. Uh, his 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 landing position with his lower half is not nearly as wide. Like he's doing a split and and getting stuck with the bat behind him. Like he seems like he's gotten back to to where he was when he was you know the guy that was taking Major League Baseball by storm when he came up. And you know in the beginning it was it was tough. We talked about really struggling with pitchers at the top really struggling to stay back on off speed and as a result in the first half he slashed 212 301 334 for an 80 wrc plus since then he's really been able to lean into that power again because he's controlling his lower half he's elevating um he's able to get to pitches at the top of the zone that were blowing him up right and you're going to see so many elevated fastballs uh especially when you're five nine and you know he was kind of caught in between where he couldn't get to the elevated fastballs and then he was swinging over the breaking balls now he's punishing the elevated fastballs, and I think it's given him more confidence to be able to handle stuff working down from there. In the second half, he's slashing 252, 338, 580. Nine home runs and six triples, though, in that span. He's just doing damage everywhere. A 146 WRC+. plus. It's just been so fun to see him start to become Corbin Carroll again. He's only striking out 19% of the time still, too, while tapping into this additional power. And, and just seeing it go the other way, oppo bombs. He's pulling absolute rockets that get out in, in, in a microsecond, it feels like. It just seems like he's back to that twitchy, explosive, but under control hitter that got the $180 million contract, right? And um, the biggest thing that I've seen too is I think because of his ability now to be more under control and feel like he's quicker to the ball, he's making better swing decisions. And we've seen him, you know, not chase as much. It just seems like he's back to Corbin Carroll. And, you know, that's absolutely massive for these Arizona Diamondbacks who are, you know, they, they need him to be Corbin Carroll if they're going to get back to the World Series. And I just keep thinking about what this Diamondback is, lineup is going to look like when Cattell Marte returns and Christian Walker returns and Gabby Moreno returns. And then you got Corbin Carroll on fire. You got Jake McCarthy taking the next step. Adrian Del Castillo, they got to find, you know, spots for him in the lineup with the way he's been swinging it. Josh Bell, you said it yourself and down to Gino Suarez. I mean, this is a prolific, prolific lineup. So let's get into my fifth and final guy. Austin Wells, mm -hmm. a 152 WRC plus in the second half, 24th in all of Major League Baseball, second among all catchers, just trailing Yiner Diaz. Now, in the first half, we know there was a lot of line drives. There was a lot of fly balls to the warning tracks. There was a lot of hard hit ground balls, and he was getting pretty unlucky. But I think just saying that is not telling the full story because in the second half, what I've seen from Austin Wells is not quite Juan Soto level at bats from a professionalism standpoint, taking pitches, making good swing decisions, but the ability to hit the ball so much harder than he already was. His hard hit rate from 29% to 42%, which is Fantastic. And he also just cut down on the ground ball rate in general. So if we're looking at his splits from the second half and the first half, I'm pulling them up right here. I mean, we have to remember this guy's a 25 year old catcher, too. If we're talking about young players, first half, 216, 309, 377, 686 OPS. Yeah, he was getting unlucky, but now he's not getting unlucky anymore. Mm -hmm. And he's been much better. 314. A catcher's hitting 314. 397. 500 slug for an 897 OPS. Six homers in the first half. Four in the second half, but in way less ABs. Driving the ball with authority. Striking out less. This guy has been. And catching well. And catching well. This guy has been the protection for Aaron Judge. We talk about Juan Soto coming in before him. Then Judge. Then Wells, the Yankees have their fourth hitter. And I listen to Michael K all the time. I listen to Yankees radio religiously. I love Yankees radio. And they're always continually talking about the fact that, and when they get callers too, Wells needs to be in the lineup regardless of if he's catching or not. If he could play first base, if he could DH, I know they're standing there, but his bat has to be in the lineup. And I agree with every 
Joe from Staten Island or Ricky <laughs> from Queens who are just screaming at Michael K. They are right in that sense. His bat is so important for the Yankees. And to see him not only just some of the luck hit back in for him, but just generally so much better at the plate, both through the contact quality and just the amount of pitches that he takes, professionalism in the box. And I mean, I always emphasize, you know, talking to catching prospects as they you know go through the minor leagues and then eventually get to the major leagues, like their priority, especially at the bigs, is to be a catcher, right? Like, of course, they want to hit, but your priority is to handle the staff well, to work with those guys and and to do your job behind the dish. And so that that's what they're focused on. The, the hitting does kind of come secondary. So, you know, for guys like Austin Wells, you know, he's focused on the glove, which has come so far. And then, you know, at the big league level, you still got to get comfortable preparing for games, uh, helping your pitchers, you know, get ready for those games and and studying and, and doing all those things. And then, you know, all of the, the defensive things that go into just being able to be a good blocker, receiver, you know, catch and throw. So, you know, the, the bat is always going to come a little bit later with, with a lot of these guys and uh, for, for, for Wells to already do it in that first season here and really shift it. Usually it'll be like year two, year three he's had that click that quickly. It's just a testament to how talented he is and has always been offensively. I mean, I, I go back to watching this guy hit, you know, three home runs and a double header on the Cape and you know, it just, he's always been able to hit. Um, but it's been really cool to see him really just blossom into this well-rounded catcher that I know the Yankees have to be amped about having for a, a long time now. And, and it really helps their outlook when we're talking about throwing money in other directions that you're going to have a catcher on the minimum for a couple of years here that could be performing like a well above average backstop. So we were going to give you one pitcher each of guys who have excelled in the second half and didn't have a great first half, but arm and I, again, to pull back the curtain, just stopped this episode and said, Jack and I are on tomorrow. Why don't we do five pitchers in the American league and five pitchers in the national league tomorrow as our idea for tomorrow's show. So that's what everybody will get. So we'll save the pitchers for tomorrow. And now is <laughs> one of my favorite segments of the week, because I just sit here and do absolutely nothing and listen to arm Layton break down the hottest prospects from the last few weeks. Arm who's been catching your eye in the minor leagues these days. Oh, man. Well, it's been fun because you get prospects who maybe were aggressively promoted over the last month or two or just promoted period that are now starting to settle in at that new level and go crazy or guys that have just mashing and just continue to fly through. So it's been kind of a, a wide range of players that I think have been performing quite, quite well. But I got to start with a guy that I think could have big league implications. And we've talked about him, but Dalton Rushing and with Dalton Rushing Dodgers prospect catcher who has was very focused on developing as a catcher at what he's been doing offensively is crazy and they have had him playing left field in anticipation of potentially bringing him up uh, at the big league level as we know jason hayward uh they just cast it aside uh i believe that they sent down andy pajes like there is a good chance that as rushing gets more comfortable in the outfield and th there's going to need to be some more reps out there defensively that he could be up there and be a guy that helps them Offensively, last 20 games between double A AA and triple A, mostly triple A now, 343, 453, 657 slash line. That's an 11 11 OPS, six home runs, walking at a 15% clip and striking out at an 18% clip. You could say, oh, but the PCL, he had a 900 OPS in the 40 games prior. So, yeah, you're seeing a little bit of the PCL bump, but I think you're also seeing the benefit of this guy not catching and not having to do all the things that we just talked about and, and prepare. He told me. In spring training, when we talked to him on the call up, that catching is the priority for him and that he's been, you know, relishing the opportunity to, to handle Yamamoto and Walker and, um, you know, and, and this incredible staff uh, during spring training, Bobby Miller, et cetera. And that's what he was focused on. So now just focusing on the bat, we're seeing the results. And I think Dalton Rushing's going to be a guy that can get up and help the Dodgers uh, down the stretch here this season. Dalton Rushing is, is such an incredible story because wasn't he Henry Davis's backup? Yes, at he barely caught in college. Barely which is caught. incredible. I mean, the guy who went number one, who was his teammate, who's actually probably going to end up being a little bit better than Henry Davis. I agree. I agree. Actually, I do think rushing is going to end up being being better, which is the craziest part. Cam Collier. I mean, it feels like he's been around way longer than he has, and he's so young. Reds prospect that's 19. He kind of fell in the first round to, to the 18th pick uh, to them or wherever it was, somewhere in that range. And 
I mean, it was good out of the gate. You saw crazy power. And then you also saw kind of iffy swing decisions. And that resulted in you know him starting to struggle to hit the ball in the air consistently, to, to just be that complete hitter that we saw just fly through, you know, get his GED and go straight to Juco at like 16 years old and 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 then play on the Cape as like a 17 year old and do all these crazy things. Uh, we're really seeing him blossom now. And there's a mechanical adjustment that that precedes that, which I'm really excited to dive into. That's going to be my next like thread and, and piece that I'm going to put out is a Cam Collier swing adjustment that he's made over the last 20 games or so. But you've also seen uh, the results follow. He hit three home runs in one game uh, the other day. And and that's been impressive considering that, you know, he's, he's at high A at 19 years old, uh, but it's been beyond that. He's just been a much more complete hitter overall. His last 25 games, he's hitting 380, 532, 709. That's a 1240 OPS. He's walked 25 times against just 18 strikeouts with six home runs. He has cut his chase rate down in the second half by 12%. And the other thing that I love is, and it doesn't work for everybody, but Collier's always been a guy with a good feel for the barrel that I think he he got away from being a hitter, turned into more of a swinger because the EVs were so exciting. Now he's back to, to that hybrid. And with two strikes, he's choking up now and he's still doing damage, but he's making more contact and he just seems to be maturing as a hitter. So he's been one of the hottest, I think, bats in the entire minor leagues. And it's been really fun to watch him do his thing. Um, And again, reminder, just 19 years old, a guy I expect to be in our top 100 update. Next guy is an absolute masher as well. Also in high A, also a first round pick, but a year later, Bryce Eldridge, remember, he was drafted as a two-way guy. The Giants were so impressed by the bat that they end up saying, you know what, scrap the pitching stuff. Let's focus on the bat. And I actually thought he had a high floor as an arm. 6'7". And this guy has a pretty darn good feel for for the barrel for a guy that's 6'7 at 19 years old. He looks like he's 30, by the way. Last 25 games, was promoted to high A as well. 337, 442, 587 slash line. This is a power over hit 19 year old who's 6'7, and he's only striking out 21% of the time. And in that span, has launched six home runs. His 90th percentile exit velocity of 106 is already comfortably plus off the charts for a 19 year old. And again, the Giants seem to have a really good one here who will now have monster numbers under his belt before his 20th birthday in high A. I think he's a guy that you're going to see flying up top prospect lists. Another guy who has flown up our list already and is in our top 10 is Roman Anthony and the Red Sox. I mean, this is their best prospect. And, you know, people talk about Marcelo Meyer versus Roman Anthony. It, to, to me, it's, it's Roman Anthony. And, and it's, it's beyond just the fact that he's younger and, and has produced either similarly or better. It's also the fact that he just gets better every time you check in. He's playing center field and he can play a legit center field. They've already promoted him to AAA. He turned 20 in May and over his last 25 games, between double A AA and triple A, he's slashing 352, 424, 610. He's a 20 year old in the upper minors. It's a 1033 OPS, seven home runs, a 9% walk rate, only an 18% strikeout rate. His swing decisions have been strong. He's just looked like a well rounded player. And he's doing this while playing center field. And he's 20. He's going to keep getting better and better and better. And, and I think this guy has perennial all-star potential that's why he's a top 10 prospect for us but to be doing this in double and then now triple a not even slowing down in triple a it's a guy that could end up breaking camp i mean potentially next year or at least could get up earlier than people would have expected from you know not a first round high school guy that the red sox were excited to sign and over slotted but you know i don't think anybody was expecting him to blossom this quickly one more bat before i get into a couple arms quick interjection just real real fast I'm just thinking about the Red Sox. Like, Sedan Rafael, a shortstop slash center fielder, has been playing some shortstop because, of course, Jaron Duran plays center. With the way that Roman Anthony is progressing through the minor leagues, to your point, he might break camp next year. Where the hell do you play him? Is he good enough in center to move Duran to a corner? No, and that's the thing. Duran's probably – yeah, he's definitely better in center. It's And that's why I think – Ultimately, he'll probably make a case to break camp, but they'll probably buy themselves more time. I just think he's Willier, like with all the sliders turned up. So, like, do you trade Willier? Do you trade uh, Yoshida at that point? And then does that open up a spot? I'm really interested because the other challenge though is they're all lefty. Yeah. So it's it's like it's a weird spot to be. It's and a great Meyer's problem. A lefty too. Yeah. 
and Teal's a lefty too. Yeah. It's <laughs> I didn't even Endeavors think about is a lefty yeah. and Casas is a lefty. And it's it's bizarre. So I feel like they've got to make this like surprising trade, maybe where they move a Willier or Yoshida. Like they're all lefties. And Roman has just more upside than anybody in their system. And I think has more upside than Willier and has more upside than just about anybody, you know, not named Jaron Duran, because Duran's, you know, doing both in center field. But I mean, Anthony could hit 30 plus homers. So the Red Sox, Greg Breswell has a, a, a fun but challenging uh, off season, and I think early next season with with decisions to make. But they could cash in and go, you know, convert that into some pitching. I think. So Rob Ref Snyder is arguably the most important right-handed bat on the Red Sox team right now. Like he's, he's the he's, guy you have to extend. You got to build yeah, around Ref Snyder as the righty. He's the whole team. He's the whole um, team. Well, Connor Wong too. Yeah, Wong and then uh, Story. Whenever they go yeah. back, it's it's just three righties. That's it. Offense so, crazy over there in Boston. We keep talking about it, and it's only going to get better. It's nuts. They it's are nuts. prolific offensively. I'm just interested to see how they convert into yeah, if they convert that to pitching because as you talked about earlier, they need it. Yeah. Um, guy that I've really excited, like been happy to see come alive because he's had a lot of injuries and you know did have the prospect pedigree in the past. Guardians outfield prospect George Valera, uh, mm. really sweet swing from the left side. I've definitely. Been lower on him now because the the glove is is not great and you know that he's gonna have to really slug and look, has he been perfect? No, he's still striking out. But I, I just wanted to highlight him just because it's exciting to see him in AAA just just starting to swing it and be productive again. Last twenty five games, eight homers, nine ten OPS, still punching. But I, I thought just to see twenty six hits in twenty five games and have that nine ten OPS with six homers, driving it to all fields, that is positive. He is still just twenty three years old. Um, I wanted to hit on just a couple arms real quick. Go ahead. Travis Sakura. We just talked about him in the Nationals top prospect update that we did for the call up in on justbaseball.com, which you can check out. He was an overslot guy uh, out of high school, third rounder, and the Nats were excited to get. He has been outrageously good in his first pro season here. Uh, and and I mean, six, six righty, 230 pounds in low A, should get to high A soon. He's got a fastball that can get up to the upper 90s. He's got a splitter now that's gross and a really good slider. It's three potential plus pitches. He, in his last four starts, has a 1-3-1 ERA, a 0.86 FIP, 20 and two-thirds innings. He has struck out 31 and walked two. Wow. Struck out 31 and walked two as a 6-6, 19, just turned 20-year-old right-handed pitcher. This guy has a chance to be a monster. Fastball averaging 95. Slider opponents are hitting 0-92 against, and the splitter opponents are hitting a buck 67 against. Pitching is getting fun in, in in Washington all of a sudden with Susana doing what he's doing as well. Quinn Matthews, I kept I kept saying that he could be a guy that ends up helping the the uh, Cardinals down the stretch here. And Quinn Matthews, remember the guy that threw 156 pitches for Stanford, fifth round pick or sixth round pick for them. I think they've really drafted him because he's a pitchability guy. And we talked about how his fastball velocity went from low 90s to now sitting 95, touching 97. It's made his slider better. It's made his changeup outrageously good because he's got crazy amount of separation and he's mixed in this curveball. His last five starts have been crazy. And he's already in double a fills up the strike zone with, I think a fastball that's plus now with the shape that it has a slider that's plus and a changeup that, that flashes plus. So another guy with three potential plus pitches last five outings in double a in a hitter friendly, Texas league 0.85 ERA. He has struck out 49 batters in 31 and two-thirds innings with five walks. That's a 43% strikeout rate and a 4% walk rate. Opponents are hitting mm. 139 against him. 139. I mean, it, it's crazy what he's doing. I think he's a guy that's going to be in their rotation next year. I think he's one of the best left-handed pitching prospects in baseball now. I think he's just solidified himself as that with the stuff uptick and still having the ridiculous command that he has. And then last but not least, I, I did want to mention that uh, – you're seeing continued success from Caden Dana who, who, with the a angels. Who's just continued to churn out good starts in double a, but I, I have to talk about your Donnie Manegro and your Donnie Manegro is, is a name that I wanted to get onto because we have not really touched on him too much this year. Manegro is that red Sox pitching prospect who could end up really helping bolster the system. Cause we're talking about kind of the lack of, of arms, Luis Perales had really broken out this year and then unfortunately had to undergo Tommy John surgery. Manegro, 21 years old in high A, he's on a on quite a run right now. 25 consecutive innings without an earned run. And I actually think if you keep going back, holy crap, I didn't go back far enough. Seven, his last seven starts, 
34 consecutive innings without an earned run in high A. He has struck out 42 and walked just nine. He's a 6'4 righty. Fastball is like a heavy sinker with late dive that just gets plenty of ground balls, but then he'll also run a four-seamer up high. He's got a splitter, a slider, a curveball. Like, he will come at you with all these different pitches, a funky release that's tough to see. And, I mean, the fact that he has gone seven consecutive outings without allowing an earned run is crazy. And in that span, opponents are hitting 113 against him. Like, this is a guy that is starting to really settle in here. We've talked about the development that the Red Sox now have pitching-wise and, and the infrastructure that they're building. Manegro seems to be making that leap at 21 years old and um, is is probably the most – the hottest pitcher in the minor leagues right now. By the way, also Rhett Louder really settling in as he's got called up to, to AAA and looks like he could be a guy that gets a late call up this year now that he's been solid for the Reds as well. I mean, just unbelievably fantastic breakdowns, but, you know, I'm your friend, and I thought that you'd maybe bring a Yankee prospect one of these days, but no worries, you know, it's not like, you know, it means something And they got enough me. at the big leagues. Yeah, they'll, they'll be doing fine, but everyone, I hope you appreciate, or, or excuse me, I hope you Love that episode. I hope you appreciated it. I don't even know what to say. I hope you enjoyed this episode where we're breaking down five of the better in the American League and the National League hitters. Tomorrow, pitchers that have been excelled in the second half compared to the first half, giving them some of their flowers for the adjustments that they made. It'll be Jack and myself. But also, I am asking, if you could rate and review Spotify, Apple Podcasts, five stars, and leaving a written review is greatly, greatly appreciated. All of this stuff is free. And, of course, um, on YouTube, hitting that like button, hitting the subscribe button, the best way to support these videos. If you have been enjoying, again, to help us grow, to help us continue to give as much free content as humanly possible, liking, subscribing, rating, and review is the best way to support without spending a dime. And if you're interested in spending a couple shekels, check out this shirt. The Just Ooh. Baseball Yankees logo. We got a shirt for every single team inscribed with Just Baseball. Hopefully, you'll go check that out in the merch store. But again, if not, and you're looking to hit a game, game time, code Just Baseball, $20 off. Bet MGM, code Just Baseball, $1,500 off that first bet offer. For Arm Layton, I am Peter Apple. Of course, we'll see you tomorrow. And with that, thank you, everybody. <laughs>